What is recently happening in Mexico in regard to the cannabis legislation? So in um, over the last year, the Senate had a mandate sent to it by the Supreme Court that they had a certain period of time to regulate, well, to modify single five articles in the general health law. Um, because of the jurisprudence that we gained at the Supreme Court level. And so what this means is that the Senate had until October 31st, 2019 to take away the prohibition on cultivating for personal use. The government has come forward, the Senate and, and the, the Justice Committee in particular, has come forward with a proposal that would actually regulate the whole market. Um, but they were supposed to do it by October 31st. They didn't reach that deadline. They asked for more time, and now they have until April 30th, 2020, to change the law. What do you expect how the new law will look like? They are proposing three ways to have access, which include cultivation for personal use with a maximum number of, of plants four and six if you live with another adult. We believe that number is very low and should be increased in order for it to be a sufficient number of plants that you could really supply for your own personal use. Um, they are proposing cannabis associations, which is something we've also been advocating for, but they limit it to 20, so, um, 20 members. We think that that's a number that's very low because this should be a non-profit model that is really an alternative to the commercial model and that cultivation for personal use and the cannabis clubs or the associations really would be the first ways to gain access and that would be the way that um, a person who consumes would be able to leave the illegal market and be able to begin participating. They also right now have a registry that that they're imposing upon people who want to cultivate for personal use and we think that that's um, discriminatory and should not be applied. And as, a, as an organization and as a coalition we really work and towards the rights of people who use cannabis and the rights of communities that currently cultivate cannabis that we would like to see transition from the illegal market to the legal market. We want them to be the main players in the commercial model that's proposed. In that commercial model, the main um, concerns we have is around that the seeds have to be uh, show that they come from a legal country or a legal origin. That means that we would have to import seeds from other jurisdictions. That seems completely wrong because we have a, a very vari a variety of genetic uh, material seeds that have worked in the microclimates of the country. Um, they also put high barriers to access on the tracking mechanisms that they want you to have from seed to sale tracking. We actually believe that only the final product should be passed through some sort of laboratory testing um, as you would sell uh, ketchup rather than tomatoes. They also, around the packaging, have put high barriers to access in that they require it to be biodegradable, recyclable, and, and, and anti-children, like so that children can't open the packaging. It would only be large transnational organizations or companies that would be able to meet those requirements. It's one thing to say um, we want things to be biodegradable but not to impose that because we don't impose that on any other industry that exists. So our goal is really about how do we, and right now in the law they have uh, determined, they've allocated 40% of the licenses for cultivating and harvesting to what they determine campesinos, farmers, um, or impacted communities. We would increase that number. It needs to be at 80%. And this understanding that those are the communities that have been most affected by prohibition, they're the ones that we need to put in the center. So the system you described is very similar to the Uruguayan system to me. Uh, was it inspired by the Uruguayan model? Well, so the difference with the Uruguayan model is that they have a state body that buys all of the product and then distributes it. And we are not proposing that the state hold that role. In personal cultivation and in cannabis associations, yes, we are definitely inspired by them. And also recognizing that the majority of people who use cannabis in Uruguay are actually being supplied through a cannabis club rather than pharmacies. And so we see that as a, as a really positive um, 
kind of aspect of their regulatory model. And we went to our colleagues in Uruguay and we asked them, how many members of cannabis clubs do you think you need in order to reach kind of a, a, a low price point per gram? Because they actually pay more than in pharmacies because they're only allowed to have 45 members. And they told us, we think between 150 and 200 members. And that's why in the law that Olga Sanchez Cordero presented, it's it was at 150 members. Where we are then creating kind of our own Mexican model is really about how do you recognize the market that already exists and how do you try and transition those communities and those people to move from an illegal space and an informal space without rights, without being able to really um, take advantage of the possibilities, how do we move those folks into a legal framework which we also believe will help uh, stimulate rule of law. Uruguay, they were able to put into place a strong government mechanism, but they're three and a half million people, and we're 130 million people. So we don't, I don't believe that the state has that capacity, and I also think that um, one of the things that's in the law that we see as a positive is that these campesinos, we would call them social sector, have the capacity of vertical integration where they could cultivate, transform, produce, and sell. Whereas if you're just a business, you can only have one type of license. The, the vertical integration is limited to those private sector folks, but not to the se social sector. So they might have the opportunity to then develop products um, that, that could give them better revenues from the work that they're already doing. So that's our goal. Um, one lesson we learned from North America was that it is much more difficult to beat the black market than we expected before legalization. So how do you uh, expect to do that in Mexico? Do you think this model will be more successful in uh, like substituting the black market and making it obsolete? Yeah, I mean, I think in Mexico there will probably always be some illegal market because we have a history of exporting for um, other places where it is illegal um, and we don't expect a legal market to cover all of that demand. Um, but I think that the best way that you can cover uh, an illegal market is by making access as easy as possible. I currently, because I have one of the Supreme Court cases, I cultivate, I have four plants. It's just a coincidence that I have four plants. I do not cultivate enough to supply my own use with four plants. If I was a person who was making um, oils or some other kind of preparation, I would definitively not be able to um, supply my own consumption. And so I think that we need to make cultivation for personal use and, and cannabis associations very easy to access routes that can really be something community driven and that will allow, um, I would hope for us to cover, you know, 15 to 20 to 25 percent of the market just with those two access routes which is also why it's important then that in the the day after the law is passed and it's published in the official uh, newspaper of the set of the government that someone could just cultivate you don't that they don't have to go register that they don't have to go ask for permission that they don't we can't wait to put the bureaucracy in place which is the regulatory institute that we highly approve of and that we think should be a new government agency to apply this kind of, um, to, to, to regulate this market. But so we need that to be easy enough that folks just start participating without that bureaucracy. We need to reduce the possibilities of the state extorting people who use cannabis. And that means taking away the crime of possession. P possessing should not be a crime. Um, no matter what the quantity is. The, the state should have to prove that I was doing it in a commercial way without having the proper license, and then they could sanction me administratively. So we, for us, this is about attacking corruption too, because the actor that we really believe we can change in this whole process is the state. And the state has a responsibility to change how they come to users and the, the relationship they have with people who use cannabis and how they show up with cultivating communities. No longer eradicating their crops, but rather seeking to say, what do you need to participate in this market? How do I support and motivate that you being part of a legal market? This year we will um, not celebrate, but we will commemorate that we are getting to 100 years of cannabis prohibition in Mexico. On March 15th will be the day that we 
turn a hundred years. And in Spanish, we have a saying that says, there's no bad thing that can last a hundred years. Uh, we see many big companies coming to Europe lobbying for the North American commercialized model. Do you see that in Mexico too? Yes. So we know that there are certain companies that have offices in Mexico, cannabis companies, that are looking at Mexico as um, cheap labor. I mean, they've said it in so many words in different forums. They see a big opportunity because we have so much sun, we have very fertile soil, we have very good conditions for cultivating and for harvesting many times over the year without the need for greenhouses. It cannot be an extractive industry in Mexico. You know, 80% of the mines in Mexico are owned by Canadians. We cannot have that happen with cannabis because cannabis can be something that begins to shift the structural conditions of inequality in the country and that's what we're seeking to do with this.